This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In 1949, Annie Curry lost custody of her two young boys in a bitter divorce case and vanished from their lives. Her son, Jim, has never forgotten his mother, even though he hasn't seen her for more than 40 years. Recently, two inmates escaped from an Oklahoma jail and embarked on a vicious murder spree in which four people have lost their lives. These dangerous fugitives must be captured before they kill again. Ensconced in her sprawling mansion, Ellen McClung Berry was a classic Southern lady, imperious, well-bred, and proud. In 1978, an elegant, mysterious visitor charmed Mrs. Berry, moved into her estate, became her most trusted confidant, and robbed her blind. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. On September 19, 1991, two-time convicted killer Michael St. Clair orchestrated a daring escape from Bryan County Jail in Durant, Oklahoma. St. Clair released fellow inmate Dennis Reese, who is awaiting trial for robbery and murder. That night, Michael St. Clair and Dennis Reese ignited a murderous crime spree that has stretched across eight states and left at least four dead in its wake. Authorities urgently need your help to capture Michael St. Clair and Dennis Reese. With each passing day, the odds increase that another innocent person will fall victim to their brutal rampage. Please watch carefully. You may help save someone's life. Less than three months ago, Michael St. Clair was convicted on two counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to three consecutive life prison terms. Michael St. Clair has been involved with various drug trafficking organizations in southern Oklahoma as well as northern Texas. His uncle was, uh, was moving in on his drug operations and he felt that his profits were being threatened, so he contracted out to have his uncle killed. Uh, after his uncle was killed, he then uh, assassinated the, uh, the hitman. Two days after the fugitives escaped, newspaper reporter Tom Mullins received a chilling phone call from Michael St. Clair. Just a minute, man. Let me get my tape recorder hooked For up. For almost 20 months now, I've been covering Michael St. Clair. It, I've gotten to know him fairly well. And I've always tried to give his side of the story in all fairness. When he got out, I was the obvious choice for him to get his message out, that message being that he wouldn't be taken alive and that when the time came, uh, if, if any law enforcement came around, his quote was, anyone wearing a badge, I'll kill. Three weeks later, near Elizabethtown, Kentucky, a state trooper pulled over a pickup truck, which was seen fleeing from a burning vehicle. As the pickup truck came to a halt, the man on the passenger side, who we now believe was St. Clair, instantly got out of, the, out of the truck. The man fired at the trooper's car two times. The trooper, fortunately, was not injured at all. Within just a matter of minutes, the maroon truck was actually found disabled and abandoned 
uh, along the interstate. Apparently, it had crossed the interstate and, in doing so, had blown both front tires. The truck belonged to 56-year-old Francis Brady, a retired distillery worker and father of three. Brady had disappeared 12 hours earlier after cashing a check at a convenience store. Brady's body was found approximately 12 miles north of Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Uh, he had been shot execution style. He had been handcuffed and had been shot in the head. What is remarkable about this type of execution is that it's almost identical to the way St. Clair's uncle, Ronnie St. Clair, had been executed a few years before. The other truck that St. Clair and Reese had set fire to was registered to a Denver, Colorado paramedic named Tim Keeling. Like Francis Brady, Keeling also vanished after patronizing a convenience store. His body was found in a roadside ditch outside of Clayton, New Mexico. Five days after firing on the state trooper, Michael St. Clair and Dennis Reese apparently struck again, this time in Tennessee. Two men matching their descriptions robbed a video store in Milan, Tennessee. They brutally executed the clerk, a 20-year-old mother of two. 30 minutes later, the same two men robbed another video store just eight miles away, again. The young female clerk was gunned down in cold blood. Individuals who would kill for $100 and $150 or $200 are extremely desperate individuals. Uh, it indicates that they do not have any type of support apparatus going for them. So these are people who are constantly moving. They're very concerned about staying in one location for any period of time. They're very paranoid. They're very dangerous. Uh, and will take any actions to prevent their apprehension. These individuals seem to be leaving no witnesses in their crimes that they're committing. And so the public needs to be very much aware of that. And if they see them, absolutely do not approach them because they are extremely violent. Next, a gothic tale of murder, betrayal, and greed set against the fading backdrop of the Old South. The state of Tennessee, like much of the American South, is dotted with majestic antebellum estates. A type of aristocracy still thrives here, and Ellen McClung Berry is typical of that upper crust group. By 1978, when she was 85 years old, Mrs. Berry lived in solitary splendor on a mountaintop outside the city of Knoxville, which had been founded by her great great grandfather. Isn't it a gorgeous morning? Oh, yes, it's very beautiful. It is so great. You ready for your tea, Mrs. Berry? I think she would have been considered definitely one of the local grand dames of the old school, and probably there were not many. That means that you can live on the mountain like she did and have everybody come to you, like Muhammad. It's just that simple. <laughs> One of the people who came to the mountain back in 1978 was Dan Tondevald, a vaguely mysterious man who claimed to be from Denmark. For more than 15 years, he had corresponded with Mrs. Berry, but the true nature of their relationship was unclear. Sometimes Mrs. Berry said Tondevald was her godson. Sometimes that he was a friend of her late son, Hugh. And how is your health? Oh, my health is great, Dan. Are you sure? I'm sure, a little drained emotionally, but otherwise I'm fine. You look wonderful, really. I have the strangest uh, gut feeling that this kid was bad news. But he was making Ellen happy. She was happy that he was there, and uh, if he was, in fact, a friend of her late son, Hugh, uh, for lots of reasons, I was happy that she was happy and at least somebody was on the mountain with her at night in case she fell or got sick and could get help. He was taking the place of her son. He looked like her son, apparently. 
And I know that was the attraction. Mrs. Barry's attraction to Dan is that he was playing that role. Mrs. Barry's only child, Hugh, had left a dark stain on the family tree. In 1951, at the age of 18, Hugh Barry flew into a rage over his inheritance, turned a shotgun on his grandmother, and killed her. A judge ruled Hugh Barry mentally incompetent to stand trial. Rumor had it that Hugh was lobotomized and sent to live in Mexico. On New Year's Eve, 1963, Mr. and Mrs. Barry received word that Hugh had died of pneumonia. Later, Mrs. Barry hinted that he had, in fact, committed suicide. According to his friends, Hugh's body was never returned to the United States. When her husband died in February of 1978, Ellen Barry was left all alone. You know, my stay in the estate here Almost too conveniently, the mysterious stranger from Denmark stepped in to fill the void in Mrs. Barry's life. Dan Tondevold moved into her guest house and quickly took over the day-to-day -day operation of her estate, Barrymount. Before long, he had made himself indispensable to Mrs. Barry. Not only was Tondevold running Barrymount, he was running her. I have some checks for you to sign, if you don't mind. Sure, and I'm so glad you're taking care of this for me. I didn't know this place was in such disrepair. Mrs. Berry signed anything Tondevold put in front of her. She also began to cater to his predilection for expensive show horses. We'll stand here and watch you. And I'll be hard at you. By 1983, Dan Tondevold owned a stable of seven Tennessee walkers financed by Mrs. Berry. He named all the horses Berry Mount, adding only the numbers one through seven to individualize them. Mrs. Berry seemed delighted to finance what was fast becoming a million-dollar hobby. Miss Berry's words to me was, Mr. Tondevo's hobby did not make a dent in my fortune. That was a hobby I wanted him to have. Yes, I would like to go ahead and close the deal on that stallion for $20,000. It was as if Dan Tondevo had cast a spell over Mrs. Berry. In April of 1982, she granted him power of attorney. She was a willing pigeon, so to speak. Other people, I think, have tried to tell her that uh, there was something wrong, that he, he just didn't make sense, possibly was a con artist. I don't know. Uh, and she ignored it. In 1984, Tondevold talked Mrs. Barry into taking a winter vacation in Charleston, South Carolina. Before they left, he composed a classified ad for a chauffeur requesting men who were single and asking that applicants submit a photograph. Secretly, Tom DeVoe placed the ad in the Charleston papers. At the end of their four months in Charleston, Mrs. Berry and Tom DeVoe made plans to return home. She and her hired companion would fly to Tennessee. Tom DeVoe would drive the Mercedes back to Berrymount. Suzanne, I thought we left lights on when we left. Mrs. Berry, we did. Mrs. Berry and her companion arrived at Berry Mount on March 31st, 1985. There was no sign of the Mercedes or of Dan Tondevold. Suzanne! Yes, Mrs. Berry? The phone stayed, dear. The telephone at Berry Mount, as well as all the utilities, had been inexplicably cut off. The bank is going to foreclose on the house. Your checking accounts and saving accounts are completely depleted. Mrs. Berry was virtually bankrupt. Tondevold had even borrowed money against Berry Mount to the tune of $85,000. For the first time in her life, Mrs. Berry had a mortgage to pay. For the first time in her life, she had no way to pay it. Her money was gone. Her checking account was empty. He just gutted her, took away her wealth and her pride and, and everything. Meanwhile, Dan Tondevold turned up 100 miles south of Charleston at an exclusive resort on Fripp Island, South Carolina. Unaware that his secret was out, Tondevold continued to live in high style. Mr. Tondevold. Uh, how do you do? Fine, sir, and you? Fine, thank you. I would like to speak to you about possibly upgrading my accommodations to something more suitable. Tondevold had been running up massive bills on Mrs. Berry's credit cards, but now the jig was up. All the cards were over their limit. The is substantial. I'm going to have to request some sort of payment. Well, let me go back to my villa. I shall get you a check and pay you immediately. 
I'll be right back. Yes, thank you, Mr. Tondevold. Dan Tondevold never returned. The next day, a hastily scrawled suicide note and a last will and testament were found in his suite. Two weeks later, in a swampy, deserted area of Fripp Island, a man's body was found. He had apparently shot himself in the left temple. An antique gun was a few inches away. It belonged to Ellen Berry. A dog also shot through the head lay nearby. The dead man carried no identification, but he did carry Ellen Berry's credit cards. What we need to do is have the security guard last the body was partially decomposed. Nevertheless, the coroner brought in a resort security guard to identify it. Now, it's going to be difficult because he's been dead for a while. According to what the security kind of guard said, he is a person who came to Fripp Island and said, I am Dan Tundervolt. It looks like him. From the best I can tell, sir, that's Mr. Tundervolt. Possibly may be considered more circumstantial than anything else. Investigation revealed that he allegedly did not have a a uh, social security card, nor a driver's license, uh, and had supposedly never had uh, either of these. The body was immediately cremated, as Tondevold had requested in his handwritten will. His death was ruled a suicide, but not everyone believed the man found in the swamp was Dan Tondevold. I'm not sure he's dead. Nobody that knew him identified him. You know, the coroner found him, a police officer counted, a security guard said, yeah, that's him, and he hadn't seen him but just driving by in a little security shack. Well, you can't negate the possibility that he did indeed kill himself. That's possible. I just don't believe it. It doesn't make sense to me that somebody who went through all that trouble <laughs> to get all that money and to be as nefarious about the whole thing from beginning to end as he was, was out to kill himself. A month after the cremation, Pete Ballard found a copy of Tom DeVol's classified ad for a chauffeur in the Berrymount Guest Cottage. Now, I would find it ridiculous that he would need to put an ad in the Charleston paper for a chauffeur for Berrymount. Uh, you can get them in the area, I'm sure, just as easily. Uh, and I suddenly realized that maybe he was looking for a look-alike. Absolutely gorgeous place. I think you'd enjoy it. Ballard is convinced that Tom DeVold remained in South Carolina not to hire a chauffeur, but to find a victim. The lookalike, I feel, would have been the person he ultimately killed, and then he just sort of scooted off to wherever he had planned to go. It was never reported that he was ever seen in the company of anybody, male or female. So there is no reason that for me to believe that it was anybody but Dan Thunderfold. I'm not going to say that that's not a possibility, but I certainly do not believe it to be one. The authorities remain convinced that Dan Thunderfold had committed suicide, yet a shadow of doubt lingered, giving rise to a piece of outrageous gossip. The idea is, is that Dan Thunderfold is in fact Mr. and Mrs. Berry's son, who was supposed to have died in Mexico. A very easy way to bring somebody back under an assumed name to get off the hook after having shot and killed his grandmother. Adding fuel to the rumor that Tondevold and Hugh Berry were the same person was a complete lack of any official record of Dan Tondevold. But finally, Tondevold's resume was found among his letters to Mrs. Berry, which had been stored away. The resume listed his hometown as Las Vegas, Nevada. An Unsolved Mysteries researcher turned up this 1951 yearbook from Las Vegas High School. Dan Tondevold was a member of the senior class and not surprisingly president of the Thespian Club. Many people in Knoxville considered Tondevold's Danish accent an affectation. Perhaps it was simply bad acting. In any case, the rumor that Dan Tondevold and Hugh Berry are the same person has finally been put to rest. I think he was her son's replacement. And here is this lovely little old lady left, left without any money. I mean, she is poor. 
but also left without any love. <laughs> I mean, what does she have at this point? Nothing. Today, Ellen McClungberry is 97 years old and has lost much of her ability to communicate. She lives in an apartment financed by the interest on an endowment she made to the University of Tennessee. No one knows exactly how much money Mrs. Berry lost to Dan Tondeville, but estimates run into the millions. Authorities believe he transferred Mrs. Berry's funds to European accounts, possibly in France or Denmark. In recent broadcast, we feature the compelling story of John Nellis, a man whose life has been torn apart by two wars. During one conflict, John lost his father, an American GI. In the other, he lost his son. Still wish you'd come with me. When John was five years old, his father, Melvin Nellis, was ordered back to the United States from his duty in war-ravaged China. Because his parents weren't legally married, John and his mother, a Vietnamese national, were forced to stay behind. John never saw his father again. 27 years later, John was among the last group of people to flee South Vietnam after the U.S. withdrew its troops. Tragically, amid the confusion and chaos, John's five-year-old son, Daniel, was left behind. If my father and my son watching me right now, I would like to tell them how much I miss them and I love them and and I like to reunite it and see them again. Thanks to our broadcast, John Ellis learned that his father is now retired and living in Tokyo, Japan. Incredibly, just three weeks later, John's search for his son Daniel also came to an end when they were reunited after more than 17 years. <laughs> oh, he's coming. Oh, oh yes. this is him. Oh, that's yeah. him, that's him right there. Is that what's him? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. 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 For so many years, I miss him. I think of him all the time, and I'm so happy to see him. This is a real dream come true. It's a miracle. When I saw my dad, I was so excited and very happy. When I looked into his eyes and saw his family, I found happiness. Daniel's first day in America was overwhelming. Not only did he reunite with his father, he also met his stepmother and half-sister for the first time. Now he's uh, with me. I'm going to do my best, you know, give him a good chance in life and a better future for him. Yeah, and make up for what he has lost. Come on, say cheese. March 1949, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Annie Curry, an English war bride, says goodbye to her husband, Donald, and her two little boys. After only five years of marriage, Annie and Donald have divorced. He has received custody of both sons, Daryl, three years old, and Jim, five. They haven't seen their mother for more than 40 years. I was never given the sense that I could say how much I missed her, that I could ask questions about where's my mom. She's a big question mark, and I would like to hear her voice. I would like to hear what she has to say about her life. Um, I'd like her to know me. In most ways, Jim Curry is no different from anybody else searching for a lost parent. But there is one odd twist in his story. Jim has spent most of his life looking for other people's parents. Jim Curry is senior investigator for a California public defender's office, 
an advocate for defendants who may be facing the death sentence. I've had adopted defendants before and had to find their mothers. And I've been very successful in doing that. It just is very ironic to me that I can find so much about these people's history and I can't complete my own. It's very frustrating. <laughs> Jim's parents met in 1943, during the darkest days of World War II. Donald Curry was 23, a Canadian sergeant serving in England. Annie Fry was a 19-year-old country girl from Wales. The two fell in love and were married that same year. My mother was described to me as being an outgoing, socially oriented, kind of upbeat person with a lot of vitality. She's a young girl, really. In 1944, London was still being bombed by the Nazis. Annie was pregnant when the impact of one of the bombs knocked her to the ground. She miscarried. Annie became pregnant again, and Donald sent her to live with his parents in Vancouver. On December 20th, 1944, Jim was born. Annie's delight was tempered by the absence of Donald, still stationed in England. She's in a foreign country. She doesn't know anybody except for my dad's immediate family. She makes the best adjustment she can, but it's a lonely kind of existence for her, and I think fraught with a lot of fear, you know, that whether or not my dad was going to make it home. Go to sleep. In June of 1945, Annie's prayers were answered. The war in Europe was finally over, and after more than a year of separation from his wife, Donald Curry was home. Joy to meet his son for the first time. But the happiness of his homecoming was short-lived. The war had changed him forever. It was a very traumatic experience for my father. He thought war was wrong. He told me once that you'll never know how much it can change you when you see your closest friends blown into a thousand pieces in front of your eyes and you can do nothing about it. I think he lost a lot of faith. He closed down emotionally to protect himself. In 1945, a second son, Darrell, was born, and Donald Curry found a position as a customs official. His job took him out of the house every night. Annie was left alone and began spending time with one of her neighbors, a much older married man. Soon the relationship turned into a full-fledged affair. A relative broke the news to Donald, and he sued Annie for divorce and for custody of the boys. I believe the petitioner, Mr. Curry, implicitly. He's a clean, wholesome individual with a fine war record. I hereby grant a decree in his favor against Anne Allen Curry and the custody of his two children. My understanding of the judgment against my mother was that my dad was to have sole custody of both children, and she was to have no visitation rights. It would be up to my father whether or not she would be allowed to see the children. Mr. Curry, you must realize that there is more good than evil in this girl. So do not burn your bridges. She has been a clean and decent girl until she met the correspondent. The judge's decree doesn't indicate hostility toward her. It indicates that even there may be something we're salvaging, that she was under the blandishments of an older, more sophisticated man, in spite of all the negatives I've heard, and on the surface it being a very nasty divorce, there was still something that came through for the judge. 
This was basically a good person. Well, you think you need to long johns? Yeah? All right. Donald Curry elected to send his younger son, Daryl, to live with a couple he knew in Vancouver. And don't talk back to your father. Annie, powerless, tried to put on a brave face. Do you want your favorite shirt? Yes, I think so. And Daryl, I want you to know, just because I'm not there doesn't mean I don't love you. Just after the divorce was final, Donald Curry broke his family apart. Daryl would eventually be adopted. Jim would see his mother one final time. Several months after the divorce, Donald Curry decided to move to Los Angeles with Jim. Just before the departure, Donald let Annie tell Jim goodbye. He needs his mother. I don't think so. He needs his brother. He needs me. Look at him. I don't have to. I know what he feels. Despite Annie's pleas, Donald remained unmoved. There was a sense in me at the time that it was the last time I would see her. I don't remember any hugging. I don't remember any arguing. But I do remember it being sad. I remember my feeling sad and confused and sort of like just not very powerful in this situation. Whatever was happening was out of my control. In Los Angeles, Donald Curry married twice. Both stepmothers were kind to Jim. Still, he yearned for the mother he barely remembered. My dad was always very reticent to talk about his early life and my mother in particular. Anything that would lead my dad to believe that I wanted to find her was very upsetting to him. Donald Curry died in 1989. After his father's death, Jim Curry began to search for his mother in earnest. Although Jim has unearthed no new clues to Annie Curry's whereabouts, he has found his brother. Daryl is married and still living in Vancouver. He and Jim have been reunited, but Daryl's loyalty is to his adoptive mother and father. He has no memory of Annie or Donald. Despite Daryl's reaction, Jim is more committed than ever to finding his mother. There's an unconditional love that a mother has for her son, and I feel that that was pulled away from me. I don't think I'd have to say a word to her for, for hours if I met her. I don't think I'd have to say anything. Annie Ellen Curry married again in 1951, but that marriage, too, ended in divorce. She may be using the last name from her second marriage, McDonald, or her maiden name, Fry. Jim believes she could be living in the United States, Canada, or England. The 1930s, the Great Depression. Bread lines, hobos, and shanty towns were an all too visible part of the American landscape. Millions lost their jobs, their homes, their savings, and finally their pride. Many times a destitute relied upon strangers to help them in their time of need. One such stranger was an ordinary farmer named Charlie Best. Charlie lived with his wife Alva and three children, Zella May, Carl, and Verlin, in the rolling hills of eastern Tennessee. They managed to stave off the hardships of the Depression by growing watermelons and tobacco. As darkness fell on a warm spring evening in 1939, an unknown traveler and two young girls sought refuge at Charlie's farmhouse. Evening. Evening. Name's Tom Underwood. 
Charlie Best, Justin Bud, Lucky. Charlie's daughter, Zella May, then a teenager, remembers that evening vividly. Well, actually, I was trying to find a place where the girls could pass the night under a roof for a change. He just yeah, come up to the porch and asked uh, Daddy if he would give the two little girls a bed to sleep in and said he would sleep in the barn. And Daddy told him, no, that they could stay, he could stay in, you know, house too. Where's home? I'll be honest with you, we don't have one. We've been on the move for so long. But we come down from Knoxville. Tom Underwood was a man who had fallen upon hard times. I can't even remember it's been so long. His daughters, Madeline, nine, and Ada, seven, had traveled the back roads of them for months as he searched in vain for work. Their mother had died years before. You warm enough? Yes, so am I. They spent the night, and I cooked breakfast for them. And, uh, well, up in the morning, probably seven or eight o'clock, uh, he left to walk them with the little girls again. All right. Where are you folks heading? Well, I got kinfolk uh, just north of here. I think we'll head in that direction for a while. All right. You take care. Tom told Charlie that he was taking the Bye. two girls to live with friends in another part of Tennessee while he continued his search for a job. I wish they could have stayed with us. That'd be all right. After they left, I said, Daddy, why didn't we just keep those little girls? I just didn't figure I would ever see them anymore. But a few days later, Tom and the girls passed through the area again. By pure coincidence, Zella May Best happened upon them. Hey, that man was at my house the other day. Hold on a second, I'll be back. Right. Hey, Mr. Underwood, where are you going? Well, my kinfolk couldn't take care of the girls, so we're uh, going to Knoxville. Well, I, I, I talked to my pa last night, and he said that y'all could come stay with us. Oh, can we, Dad, please? I don't know, Zelda, I don't think that's a good idea. Well, why don't you at least come talk to him? Please? All right, let's try it. Tom would later agree to leave the girls in Charlie's care until he could get back on his feet again. Times were hard, and uh, it was hard for us to survive. But he was willing to take them and, and give them a home and, and give them what we had to eat. It might not have been everything, but we never did go hungry. Madeline and Ada were immediately accepted as part of the family. Charlie treated them as if they were his own children. The two girls shared in everything with Zella May, Berlin, and Carl. We went to school together. We went to church together. We worked in the fields. They went to the fields with us. And we had mules and we had cows. And we'd have to shuck corn and feed them twice a day, pull the husk, the shuck off, and put it in a little trough and feed them. They worked as hard as men in Berlin did. You know, they'd shuck corn just like we did. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. They just didn't seem like no stranger. It's like I'd always knew them. I always wanted a sister, and I knew I never would have one. So that, they took the place of a sister. Hey, Mama. Sugar. Madeline became especially close to her surrogate mother, Charlie's wife, Alva. Alva suffered from a rare nerve disorder, which left her unable to care for herself. I think Daddy was as happy as the girls was. And I think the girls was as happy as Daddy was. They would skip and hop, you know, and he'd hold their hands, and they, they were just happy. You know, there was never nothing said about, you know, them being a stranger or anything like that. They just sort of liked one of us. And we really enjoyed, you know, being with us. Zella May remembers that Tom Underwood visited his girls at least twice. Then, after Madeline and Ada had been with the best for 26 months, Tom returned to the farmhouse for the final time. Yeah? Mr. Underwood. Zella May, I come for the children. Uh, none of their things are ready. I just did their washes out on the lawn. Could you wait till Dad gets home? I really can't tell him. It's coming on nightfall, and uh, I need to be on the road before dark. If you'll just pack some things for me and, and let me see the girls. 
He just said that, that his health was bad and that uh, he had married and he wanted the children uh, to be with the children. So, man, I don't want to go. Sorry, honey, but you have to. Why? The girl's got everything? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, Charlie, you want to say goodbye? So is that working in the field? Calvin, get your sweat. Let's go. Ada, come on. I think the reason he wouldn't wait till Daddy come in, he was afraid that Daddy would buck on him. That Daddy might say, hey, you're not going to take the children till you pay me some money. Now, that's just what I thought. Now, whether that's true, I don't know. That's the way I felt. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Best. Three months Ada, later, Charlie received a curious letter from Madeline and Ada. Where Daddy left us. Their father had placed them in an orphanage in Nashville. I think I left Charlie immediately contacted the orphanage and asked if he could adopt the girls. We love you, Madeline and Ada. But by the time the letter arrived, Tom Underwood had once again retrieved his children. It was the last time the best family heard from Madeline and Ada. Today, more than 50 years later, Charlie and Zella May still live within 10 miles of the old farmhouse. Zella May is 66. Charlie is 91 years old. How are you, Daddy? I said, how are you? Answer me, tell me you're all right. How are you? Uh, well, if Daddy could see her again, it would make him, make him cry. And of course, I know he'd tell her that he loved her. He calls them the little girls. Now, he don't call them, he don't look at them as being women. He calls them the little girls. Just the other day, he said, have you heard any more about the little girls? And I said, no, Daddy, but they're coming. They're coming. The night this story aired, Ada Underwood, now 59 years old, was watching our broadcast at her home in Indiana. Ada was shocked to see herself and her older sister, Madeline, profiled. Sadly, Madeline passed away several years ago. But for Ada, Charlie and Zella May's story stirred distant childhood memories. Ten days after our broadcast, Ada Underwood traveled to Madisonville, Tennessee, for a very special reunion with Charlie Best and his two children, Zella May and Carl. Well, I was anxious to see her. It was exciting to know she was coming. Well, you still look like yourself. <laughs> no, blood old. Glad you got to come. It, it is. It's a day I have been waiting for, for uh, really for 51 years. Yeah. And how's your father? Well, getting that kind of old. I was very excited when I heard that they were looking for me because somebody cared enough about me to hunt for me that long. Although only eight years old when she last saw Charlie, Ada never forgot the warmth and kindness he and his family brought into her life. Well, this year's Ada, Daddy, do you remember? Charlie had to be very good to my sister and I for him to take us in and take care of us when we had nobody else to take care of us. And so I think he was, had to be a really great man. You pretty. Thank you. <laughs> you pretty. He just meant a lot to Daddy. And uh, I feel that in his own mind, a uh, dream has come true. Sadly, eight weeks after we filmed this update, Charlie Best passed away. According to his family, the reunion with Ada brought Charlie great comfort in his final days. Join me next time for an all new edition of Unsolved Mysteries.
Thank you.